Last week we talked about the physical heart. <clears throat> this week we're talking about how to have a spiritual, healthy heart. And when we're talking about the healthiness of our soul, the healthiness of our heart, what is the guideline from that? How can you look at somebody and say you have a healthy heart? How do you look at somebody and say their spiritual life is great? Because there's no way that we can look at the outside and say that I think that you have it all together. Or I think that because you teach a Sunday school class that you have it all together. A healthy heart has to do with an internal process between you and God. And there has to be some things that take place before we can understand how to gain and maintain a healthy heart. Uh, there's a quote in your bulletin that says, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. What lies within us. We have to have that relationship with Almighty God. We have to understand who He is and what He has done. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, there's a story there. And that story is uh, Jesus is, is teaching the multitudes, and he was standing at the Sea of Galilee, and, and he was teaching. The, the crowds pressed in on him, so there was no room for him to teach. So he got into a boat, and he cast off a little off the shore, and he started to teach. And, and all day long, he was, he was giving sermons, and he was healing the sick. He was just staying busy, serving and doing ministry. At the end of the day, he said, you know what, let's go to the other side. Of the, of the sea. So they got into the other side, they got halfway to the other side, and Jesus being tired, he was asleep on a pillow at the stern of the ship. And what's called a mighty wind or a great wind came up, and the, the, the disciples, which were fishermen, became very afraid that they were going to perish. It, it must have been something like a hurricane or a major wind. The waves were coming. So they woke Jesus up, and when they woke Jesus up, he looked at the wind, and he looked at the storm, and he said, shh. Instantly, the wind ceased. The waters became calm. Instantly. This was the first time that they witnessed Jesus having the power, not only against flesh, disease, even the winds and the storms obey his every word. And the disciples, they were astonished. They were very afraid. And Jesus looked at them and said, why are you doubting? Where is your faith? What are you doing? Why are you doubting? Do you know who I am? Do you know that I am God do you know that I must do this? I am not here to perish in a sea of Galilee. I am here to die on the cross for sins. Don't have fear. Have faith. And they were very afraid. They were astonished. Who is this that has power over the very wind and sea? That was the very first time they had a glimpse that they were standing not only with a prophet, not only with a good man, but they realized on the Sea of Galilee, on a little tiny boat, that they were standing in the presence of God. And they were fearful. Could you imagine in your life, in your sin, in your condition, that you stand face to face with God, with him knowing everything, knowing your past, your present, and your future, and not be scared to death? Where's your faith? I have chosen you to do a purpose. And when we understand what we must do to have a healthy heart, we have to understand who God is. We have to understand what God has done. We have to understand the power that God provides. And when we understand who God is and what God can do, when we stand before him, we must be humbled because we are nothing compared to God. We had nothing if it wasn't for God. And when we get that glimpse of who God is, and we understand who we are, then we understand my brokenness is because I can't do anything if it wasn't for God. I have a brokenness because I know God can do everything for me. And I can have a pure heart. I can have a clean heart. I can have a healthy heart. When I get to the perspective God wants me to, 
I can have a clean heart. I can have a pure heart when I understand that God wants me to worship him, to honor him. He loves me in my condition. He knows my condition. And the verse that we used last week in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart, because out of your heart, out of the spiritual soul, runs every issue of life. And if we don't guard our heart, we become lackadaisical in our spiritual life. If we do not care what God thinks of us, when we think that we're playing the game, we are not guarding our hearts. And our hearts need to be so pliable, so open, so God can use us. And I believe when he uses us, he allows, once we understand who God is and what God can do, God does things for us. And I love this verse in uh, Luke chapter 6, verses Uh, 43 through 45, it says this. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known for its own kind. For men do not gather figs from thorns, or do they gather grapes from humble bushes. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of his evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. You are going to bring forth who you are and what you are. It is obvious that when we look at who we are, we can look at, see that, oh, he teaches a class or or he comes to church or maybe he worships or, or we see the attitudes of the individuals and we can say by our judge that he must be the spiritual man or he must have a healthy heart. But in 1 Samuel chapter 17, um, Samuel, which was the prophet of God, was getting ready to anoint the next king of Israel. Saul was, was disemboweled by God. So Saul was going to go off the king, and, and Samuel was anointed by God to anoint the next king of Israel. God told Saul, Samuel that he was going to be out of the he- house of Jesse. So Samuel went down to the house of Jesse, and he started looking at all of Jesse's sons. And he looked at Jesse's son, and his oldest son, his name was Eliab. And Eliab looked just like Saul, big, strong, muscular, robust guy. He looked like the next king he should have been. God looked at him, told Saul, told Samuel, nope, this is not the next king. And Samuel said, it must be. And here's what God told Samuel. He said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God He looks into the soul, into the heart of a man. We cannot impress people by what we do. We cannot impress God by how much we give. We cannot do anything to appease God for the actions that we perform and the way that we look. What puts a smile on God's face is the condition of our heart. If we have a pure heart before God, if we have a loving heart before God, if we want to serve him and we understand what God has done for us, we can honor him and worship him with a pure heart. Man looks at outward appearances, but God looks deep within the soul, deep within our heart. He understands if we have sin within our life. He understands if we have animosity, confusion, and bitterness What we must do is say, Lord, I want you to be the priority within my life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. When you do that, you understand what the heart is for. But then I ask the question, what are the elements to have a healthy heart? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? I wish I could say if you read the Bible five times a day or if you say three prayers five times a day, if you go to church five times a week or if you do this or you do that, you have a healthy heart. But a healthy heart is not something that we do physically. It is something that we deal with and understand spiritually. We have to understand what does God want? And the first thing that he wants is honesty. What's all that? As long as I'm an honest person? No. Being honest won't send you to heaven. And being honest won't give you a pure heart. But being honest with God, that is a secret. David, King David was a man after God's own heart. And King David had everything at his disposal. He was elevated all the way from the time that he was anointed 
by Samuel all the way to the time that he sinned with Bathsheba. He was a man after God's own heart, but he fell. He sinned, and when he sinned, the prophet Nathan came to him, and he said, he said, you have sinned against God, and it broke David's heart. He was found out. He was caught. He was under the conviction of God, and when he was convicted by God, he fell on his knees before God, and he gave to us the psalm, the 51st psalm. And we're going to take a look at the 51st song. When you're talking about honesty, when we understand that God can do everything, and we understand who God is, and we understand what I've done, we can go before God with a broken heart and be honest with God with our sin, with our life. But until we can be honest, what we do is we live a life pleasing to self, pleasing to man, and not pleasing to God. In Psalms chapter 51, let's read a few of these verses. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. This is a man that's broken now. He's just been found out. According to the multitudes of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. He just sinned, but he knew who he sinned to. Him and God was bigger than the sin of him and Bathsheba. And he knew that what he had to do is he had to reconcile his relationship. He had to reconcile his relationship with God, and God needed to forgive him, and he had to confess his sins before God. And when that took place, then he can deal with the horizontal. He could deal with the personal relationships once the spiritual relationship was taking place. And he fell on his face before God. He said, God, forgive me. Forgive me of what I have done. Forgive me of my sin that I've committed. And you and you alone have I sinned, and I need to make it right with you. And when I make it right with you, then I can deal with these. And in our lives, we may not have the sin of David and Bathsheba. We may have other sins. We may have sins of anger. We have sins of pornography. We may have sins of other issues. But what we must do in our sins, we must ask God to forgive us, knowing who God is, knowing his power. Remember, at the word, shh, the winds obey him. The power that God has, the abilities that God has to forgive, to create, to dominate the elements, sin, and disease. He can look at your life. He can look at your sin. He can look at your issues and say this, why don't you give them to me? Why don't you get honest with me? If you're not happy where you are spiritually, if you wake up every night, if you're struggling, if you don't know where you are spiritually at all, why don't you come to me? Because I know your heart. I know everything about your life. Be honest. Be broken enough about where you are that I can fix and take you where you want to go. But until we are honest with God, our hearts are not open enough to follow after him. And then emotions. The second one is emotions. Um, the Bible says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit or self-control is like a city broken down without walls. If you have no control over your emotions or your self-control, you have no ability to say no. You have no ability and, and sins and, and corruptions and issues will come into your life until you have the ability to control your emotions. Do your fears and your feelings collide? When your fears of tomorrow and your feelings of regret and when they collide and you have no hope and you feel like you're in total disarray, you rule your life through the flesh. You have no ability to allow God to work within your life. Your emotions struggle. And a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What we must do is we must understand that God wants us to ask him to help our emotions, to control our emotions, to be in our spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The ability to say, Lord, I need you. Do you fly off the handle 
when somebody says something? Do you get upset when they do not agree with you? Do you react negatively when somebody says something or does something to you? How do you handle your emotions? And the, ha the way that we handle emotions comes from the bitterness of the heart. And out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Until we have the heart under control, we will never be able to have our mouth or our tongues under control. And when we don't have our tongues or our emotions under control, we are not allowing God to work within our life. So some of us say, well, you know what? I can do the church thing. But you know what? I, I'm just high-spirited. I just, somebody makes me mad, I just, I just get mad. I don't, I don't have that under control. Then that's something that God wants to work within your life. You may say something, we'll say, well, one out of five is not bad, but that's not what God wants. How do you gain a spiritually healthy heart is when God says, this is what I need you to work on. I know Bruce has four of the five that he has to work on, but you know what? We're not talking about Bruce. We're talking about you. What is it that you struggle with? And if it is honesty, deal with your honesty. If it's emotion, let's talk about emotion. Because God wants us to be spiritually healthy. And if I struggle with emotional outbursts, if I struggle with those issues, what I need to do is I need to ask God to deal with those things and be honest with him about them. But then it could be your attitude. Your attitude. No amens on the attitude, huh? Give me an amen. Sometimes our attitude stinks. I was doing some counseling this week, and uh, this analogy came up, and I thought it was really good. The difference between a sprinter and a marathon runner, okay? When I was in high school, I, there's no way it was going to be a marathon, okay? Uh, uh, maybe a 200 or a 400, but there's no way I was going to run a marathon. But the way that the sprinters train for a sprint is totally different than the way the marathon runners train for a marathon. You guys agree with that? A sprinter, they do all kinds of reps. They get up on the, on the yard line, and, and they sprint, and they jog around. They may do 20 sprints for practice, and it's continual sprint all out for 100 yards or 200 yards or 400 yards, and they continue those reps, continue those reps. And they may be in shape, and they may be able to run that 200-meter dash, and they may be great at the 200 meters, but you put that guy that runs 200 meters and say, you know what? Since you're such a great athlete, I'm going to put that 200-meter sprinter in a four-mile race. Guess what that sprinter's going to do? He's going to fail. He may do good for a mile, but he's not trained for the marathon. He's not trained for those extra miles. So what he does, he trains for a sprint. In our attitude, sometimes we think, I can serve God on Sunday morning. I can serve God while somebody is talking to me. I can serve God when the issue is at hand. I can do God for a little bit at a time. I can sprint, and I can do God for a day. I can do God for a season. I can do God for a while. I can sprint in serving God. But here's what God wants us to do. He wants it to be a lifestyle. He wants us to honor Him every day. He wants our attitude to be pleasing to Him whatever circumstance happens. He wants you to be a testimony today in church he wants you to be a testimony at 1230 at the restaurant. He wants us to be a testimony every day. Our attitude has to be, how can I please God? So here's where our issues are. It may be honesty, it may be emotion, and it may even be our attitude. But in our garden of life, what we have in our garden is all kinds of beautiful flowers because on our way we plant flowers and we can make our garden look beautiful. And we can make it look good. And we can take pride in that garden during the good days. But what happens is when we go on vacation, when we say, you know what, I'm really not interested in that garden today, what happens is a little bit of weeds start popping up. Those weeds start popping up. We have a decision to make. Do I want to get into the garden? Do I want to pull the weeds today? And you know, my dad always said, Bruce, get out there and pull them weeds. Well, I'd pull the big ones, and I'd leave all the small ones. I'd buy, do whatever I need to do. But I found out if I don't get into the garden daily or every other day, and I take care of the maintenance of that garden, sooner or later those weeds are going to take over that garden. And then what I have to do is I have to look at it, and I say, you know what? That's too much work. I don't want to do that. I'm going to be out there for hours just taking care of the weeds. So what we say is, you know what, Lord? I'm not going to do that. So the attitude of our life is, 
I don't want to, so I'm going to take a step back. And in that, the weeds of our life, Satan's influence in our life, keeps on getting bigger and greater, and it can take over the very thing that you planted to be beautiful. Your life has a designated plan, but if we do not deal with the issues daily, heart, attitude, emotion, if we don't deal with those, what happens is it becomes so overwhelming, and then a major catastrophe does take place, and it draws us to our knees because God wants us to deal with the issues of life. If we want to do it on our own terms, he's happy about that. But God loves us so much, he's not going to allow us to stay with an unfruitful garden. He wants us to deal with the issues that are at hand. Your attitude should be the same of that of Jesus Christ. What is our attitude? And then our responsibility. Our responsibility. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Each one of us. Now, I have that responsibility as your pastor. Everything that is said, everything that is done from this pulpit, I have to give an account. I have to give an account for my actions. I have to give an account for my words, for the things that I say, and the things that I do. But we also have to give an account of the things that we say and the things that we do. And we have to understand accountability comes with spirituality. When Jesus gives to us his servant, he gives to us his spirit, and when we serve him and honor him, we need to know that God cares what we do and how we do it. Now, I understand the Bible does say that every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and either he is going to judge us as Savior or he's going to judge us as judge. I want Jesus to judge me as my Savior, and when I get that, is I just accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and he forgives me of my sins, and I am so thankful for that. I gain access to God, and he forgives me, and he loves me, and he wants me to honor him. But there will be a day There will be a day that the things that I do and the actions that I perform that I am going to be held accountable to, and I am going to not receive my rewards because of the things that I've done on this earth. And I understand that. It's a responsibility that I have. I want to be motivated in my calling that I be faithful to him in every step of the way. If I love God because of what God has done for me, and if I understand who God is, and what God has done, I can be very humble in saying, I am doing what I do because of what God did. I can be spiritually strong, spiritually healthy, because I love God. I have to be a motivator of mine. Not because I go to church. Not because somebody makes me come to church. I want to be spiritually healthy because God wants me to be spiritually healthy. Because God does so much. Remember on that boat, where, where's your faith? Do we realize that Jesus was God in the flesh? God is wrapped up in a human body. Maintained humanity and deity. They were face to face with God. When they noticed that Jesus was God and everything was at his disposal, Healing, forgiving, the elements, shh, everything obeyed him. I believe those disciples at that time came to the realization that they were broken, broken men that had God in their presence. Do you remember Moses at the burning bush? God was in this burning bush that didn't consume and Moses walks up to him. And God says something. He says, take off your shoes. Because where you're standing is what? Holy ground. Face to face with God. When we have the ability to have a pure heart, when we have the ability to have a healthy heart, what we're saying is, Lord, I want you. I want you to be alive within my life. I want your presence to be real within my life. We all, in our deepest need, have one issue in mind. We all, at our deepest need, want peace. We want to be able to know that God is okay with me. We want to know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. 
We all have an inner desire to have peace with God. The last point is truth. Truth. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 9, it talks about how to gain truth. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Wow, that last phrase. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will do what? Guard your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. The idea of this is guard your heart because out of the heart go the issues of life. Truth says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request be known unto God because the peace of God is going to guard the very thing that he told you you need to guard. So how you do that? And it says this in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there are any virtue and if there are anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We desire a pure heart. We desire, the church desires, individuals desire. I need to know that my sin is forgiven. I need to know that my relationships can be restored. I need to know that when I take my last breath and I close my eyes for the very last time, that I have access to God. I need to know with the bottom of my heart is what I'm doing genuinely real. And the only way that I can do that is not through chaotic lifestyles. It is to have a pure heart towards God. And I know that when I cry out to God and I say, Lord, you and you alone have I sinned. And I know that God loves me. And I know that God died on the cross for my sins. And I know that I need him more than anything else because he's power and he's peace and he's forgiveness. I can cry out to God at any time of my life, any time of your life, and say, Lord, I need you. And the greatest provider, the greatest lover, the greatest giver of the entire world will come alongside you. And if you need comfort in the midst of problems, if you need help in the midst of relationships, if you need healing in the midst of disease, if you need help in every area, Remember, shh, the winds and the seas and nature bow down to God. The thing that you're going through, the issue of your life, it's major to you. It's powerful. It's very destructive to you. But to God, I can do all things. By God, all things were created. Through Jesus, all things were made. Jesus has power to do all. What we have to do and what he doesn't make us do, come to him. Bow your knees before him and say, Lord, I need a new heart. I need you to fix my life. I need you to forgive me. I need you to work within my life. The Bible says we can ask anything, anything in God's will, and he will give it. He will desire it for us. So when we give to him our life, our broken heart, our life that's in disarray, he can take it, he can transfer it, he can give to us a new heart a clean heart, a pure heart. But he doesn't make us. He just asks us. He says, it's your will. It's your choice. I love you. I am God. And I want to give to you the very peace that's going to guard your hearts and your minds. Because out of your heart goes the issues of life. If you want the peace of God, if you want the forgiveness of God, 
What we have to do is ask him for it. And he can deliver the very needs of our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.